chat and everything, there should be a button that says record. Got it. Click that We're recording. You're on. You're good. I've only done this, right. you know, a million times now. So thank you all for joining us. I'm Frank Korb. This is our Friday Art Lunch Bunch. Um, it's a great conversation to have with some contemporary, real-world artists who are out there making a difference in the world. And this week, we have Milwaukee artist, uh, collage artist, sculptor, painter, illustrator, Della Wells. So, Della, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. This is incredible. We're, we're so fortunate. You're welcome. Um, so we'll kind of start here. Della is, uh, like I said, a uh, Milwaukee-based artist. A little bit about her. her. Your biography is wonderful. And I had to shorten up a little bit of your uh, artist statement. But, uh, that's okay, that's okay. fine. Della Wells is a self-taught artist who began drawing and painting in earnest at the age of 42. And her creative process stems primarily uh, into visual work. From her personal experiences, embellished through the art of storytelling into visual work. Wells' work has been written about and has appeared in several publications, including Betty Carroll Sellins and Cynthia J. Johansson's book, Self Taught Outsider and Folk Art Guide to American Artist Locations and Resources. And one of her images appeared in a children's book, The Classic Treasury of Childhood Wonders favorite adventures, stories, poems, and songs for making lasting memories, published by National Geographic and written by Susan Mangzeman. Um, really a wonderful biography. In 2011, award-winning play was written, inspired by her life, Don't Tell Me I Can't Fly, and debuted in Milwaukee. The play was commissioned by Milwaukee's first stage children's theater and written by Y. York. In 2010, the play was selected to be read at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. for its New Vision, New Voices Festival. Since its debut in Milwaukee, the play has been produced in Nashville, Tennessee, and in Charlotte, North Carolina. The play is published by Dramatic Publishing Company and is included in the analogy of why York's plays, Don't Tell Me I Can't Fly, 10 Plays for Children and Families, published in 2016. She illustrated a children's book, The Electric Train, by Nancy Mortimer. There's more. Um, one of the things that I really loved seeing is the, the mixture of what you've created, the dolls that you build and paint, the paintings, the collages. Um, these are available at the Smithsonian National American, African American Museum of History and Culture. Inuit Center for Outsider Art in Chicago sells her dolls and cards, and you've been featured Artist in the Kentucky Festival of Arts, the largest art festival, which features folk, self-taught, and outsider art in the United States. We had a list of all of the private corporate museum collections. I had to shorten it. That's just phenomenal. And just the list of galleries and museums and uh, private collections that you're represented by has been phenomenal. Um, and this is Della's statement. Text and memory serve as my visual evidence of how layers of imagery can reference new meaning. My ink drawings on page inserts find old patterns with new images to incite different meanings. Thus, these new images serve as a reminder that much of the past remains as a reminder that old is a part of our contemporary lives, no matter how much we want to give it a different spin. Much like what is going on in American society today. So thank you, Della, for joining us. Um, anything you want to add before I start this show here? No, you can go ahead. <laughs> okay. So this is, this is a great video, and I believe I shared the sound. Um, Della Wells' visual video artist statement, Mambo Land, is produced by Reuben Whitmore the second. He is a Milwaukee-based filmmaker and has directed music videos for the artists such as DMX, The Temptations, Too Short, and more. Born and raised in Wisconsin, moved to Atlanta after college where he earned a living directing music videos for major artists and black video. So here's Della's Mambo Land. Mm -hmm. 
As a young woman, I was very angry and depressed. Learning about other people's stories helped me to heal. I realized that I was interested in other people's lives, and learning their stories made me a more compassionate person. I created Mambo Land. The Mambo Land women take care of each other, and they are warriors through the sexism, racism, and folks just plain messing with you. In this land, black women rule. I wanted to become a writer to help counter my dysfunctional upbringing. I can shape each element of a story, fairy tales, history. I am Della Wells, and all my life I've been trying to seek my own truth. What a great, what a great video that that really describes um, your work. So just phenomenal. Thank you. Yes. Um, Ruben and Black Fox Videos, they did a really good job with that. Yeah, that was really great. Um, I can get this thing to work here. This is such a, oh, still, it's, you can watch it again later. It wasn't until later in my life that. All right, there we go. <laughs> So what we can do here is kind of walk through the images that you shared with us and however you want to drive this conversation is, is completely up to you. Okay, I, I think I'm going to um, tell everybody a little bit about myself, okay? Yep. And um, a lot of, yeah, I grew up in Milwaukee in the 1950s and the 1960s, so I'm very, very old. And... <laughs> So, and my father was from Baltimore, my mother from North Carolina. And one of, you know, one of the things that really fascinated me when I was a kid was fairy tales okay. and um, myths. And I love Dr. Seuss. Um, television, you know, you know, back then there were shows like Father Know Best, you know, and stuff. So I was really interested in that. And then plus I grew up with a lot of books because my you know, my father, he, he, you know, he loved books and actually he had enough that he could have a library and they have books almost on any subject. Mm -hmm. So there were art books, science, history books, and I loved history. Um, my mother had, had schizophrenia and, and she suffered, well, I'm going to say suffered, she went 19 years untreated. So my mother was kind of in her own magical land. So anyway, like what I do in my work, I decided in my, you know, in my work that I was going to create this magical land and where black women rule. And basically they're, you know, they dealing with a um, whole bunch, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. And how I'm going to also talk about how I really got started in art. I always knew how to draw when I was, since I was a kid, but it was just something I could do. And when I was like in seventh and eighth grade, I had a um, art teacher mm -hmm. that used to bring cow skulls in for us to draw. And he used to say, draw beautiful cockroaches, draw beautiful cockroaches. Now, in my 12, 13, 14 year old mind, I didn't want to draw cockroaches. I didn't see the beauty in skulls. And it wasn't until years later that I understood what he was trying to Tell, tell us there's a beauty in everything, even things that we perceive as being ugly. Now in high school, and I actually sold my first piece of art at age 13 and, oh. you know, and did it in wow. Mr. King class. So in high school, the, our basketball coach, and I went to you know, Lincoln Junior Senior High, which is now known as Lincoln School of the Arts, and every year when I was back, when I was there, uh, Lincoln took state. <laughs> and we had a phenomenal basketball team, Fred Brown. And I know Clarence Sherrod, they in, in, later went to play for the NBA. Oh. So one of the coach, one of the coaches was Mr. Crawford. And he was the art teacher. And actually he did some cartoons for Playboy and stuff. So <laughs> he was very competitive, like he was with his basketball team. So he when he when he entered his students into contact, he wanted to win. Yeah. 
Yeah. So basically what he pretty much let the kids that knew how to draw, he pretty much let them do what they want. But he was really a good teacher. But I'm gonna be honest with you, I really wasn't that into art. Okay. Then when I was 18, I used to stand on the bus stop and there used to be a gallery in Milwaukee called Gallery Toward the Black Aesthetics. Oh. And I used to stare in this gallery because it was really amazing to me for, for one reason. I never saw artists done, art done by Black people. All the artists I knew were white. Sure. Um, my mother used to take me to the art. I and my you know, two old, older siblings, she used to you know, take us to the art museum. So this was really fascinating. So one day, the director came out. He's, you know, and he invited me in. So I ended up volunteering there for about two years. I still didn't make any art. I wasn't interested in making art, but, you know, it introduced me to a world where African-Americans made art. I actually found out that women made, I learned that there were women artists too. And the gallery was founded by a group of young, you know, African-American, um, they had recently either graduated from school or they were students and they had went to the universities. And the gallery did receive some national attention. And what I did there with the gallery, I gave tours, I wrote reviews, and how I ended up writing a review, I never wrote one be, you know, before in my life, was that George Edwards, the director, he wrote a review and he had a college degree. And I told him, you couldn't submit this review and the review was on this art artist uh, called Kinky Shoe, who was Ed Miller then, and we called him Bubbles. And he <laughs> wrote that the women were so beautiful that they faint, you know, people would faint coming to the show. Now I was 18 years old and he was 25, and I told him, You can't put this in the paper. So I actually rewrote the re oh. review, review. So I stayed there for a couple years, and to be honest with you, I really didn't do any art because it really wasn't interest. I was planning to do it later at the age when I retire, retired, the age I'm now. I was going to do flowers. I was going to paint barns. And so basically what I did, I worked and I actually was involved with my union. Um, I was a union steward and I was also involved with this group, group nine to five for working women. And um, I wrote for their new, I wrote for their newsletter. Um, I also wrote, I was on their board, and I also did a cartoon strip in the 80s called Nine to Five with, you know, Ms. Wells, which talked about working women. Mm -hmm. And, but I still didn't, you know, I, I really wasn't, I'm gonna be honest with you, if you would have told me I was an artist, gonna be an artist, no. The only interest I had was fashion back then, and I did consider being a fashion designer, but as far as doing, you know, fine art, in creating artwork, I didn't want to do, do it. Well, fast forward, in, in my 30s, I got injured on my job, and I was told that I had to get retrained for a new job. Prior to that, what I did was computer operations and secretarial work. Okay. And um, so I had to get a you know, new job, so I was going to school, and I was going to be a psychologist, okay? And you never know where life is going to turn, you know, turn. And I, was, I went to MATC for about two years. And my history teacher was my advisor. And she went and told me specifically that I need to take some art, you know, art, some humanities. So she told me to take this art survey course. I did. I wrote a, had to write a paper. A lot of people gonna write a Picasso and Van Gogh, which they did. I wanted to write on an African-American artist and somebody from Milwaukee. And I wrote on Evelyn, about Ella, Evelyn Terry. And Evelyn remembered me from the gallery toward the black aesthetics. And she told me I was an artist. And I was thinking, woman, you crazy. <laughs> Cause you know, in my mind, I'm going to be a psychologist and you know, you know, go to the whole nine yards. So she was trying to get me to do art for two, yeah, for two years. And I didn't do it. I transferred over to the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And I was taking, I was majoring in psych, I was majoring in sociology. I was doing, and this is important because all this 
ties into my work, okay? Because mm -hmm. I used to, what I learned in psychology and sociology, I was getting a certificate in women's studies, which my work is about women. And my minor was African-American stu African studies. And so to make a long story short, she invited me to a show that her and this other artist, Mir Mukadeen, came. I went to Pelt's gallery and a voice told me to go make art. And, and Evelyn's been trying to get me to make art. I told Evelyn, I'm ready to make art now, so I'm going to go in your studio. So I did, did um, <coughs> excuse me, I did one model print and two pastels and they actually turned out. So I just start, you know, I just start creating then. And one of the reasons that I talk about women, I'm gonna talk about this particular, I'm gonna talk about this um, particular piece right here, is I, you know, I had a really rough childhood. A lot of people do because my mother was, you know, schizophrenia, and I was really angry with my parents. And a lot of you are probably too young to remember this, but. Um, Back then, there were shows like Leave it to Beaver, Father No Best, and they showed the, the perfect American family. So I grew up thinking everybody's family was like Leave it to Beaver and Father No Best. They weren't screwed up like mine. And to make a long story short, when I got grown, I found out it's, that's not true. Most people had screwed up families like, you know, like mine. Sure. So basically, <laughs> What well, you know, I think about my mother in my work because you know my mother really did have a kind of a tragic life. Um, her mother, you know, her mother died when she was a baby. You know, when she was like I think I think it's like three months, four months old. And my mother said mm -hmm. her father left, but my aunt, her half, you know, her her half sister said no. Nah. He he she was just around, and my mother. She was in an unhappy marriage. Um, she wanted to go to college, couldn't, you know, didn't, you know, didn't get a chance to live out her dreams. So basically, I, you know, a lot of the women in my work are dealing with stuff. And I like to think of my women as Eves. And this particular piece is a, um, it's Prismacolor, okay? And basically, a lot of my women, you know, one of the things with some of my women, they're building it about what they're dealing with. She's this particular piece. She's caught up in this, you know, this, you know, this web and these plants, but she's going to survive. And that's one thing that I like to think of my women and my work is survive, you know, survivals, survivors. And can we go to the next one? Sure. Okay. Okay. Now this is this is one of my collages, which you know I'm, I'm i'm known for and in this is take place in Mam mammal land and the women are the, the one of the reasons i call mammal land i remember i told you that i took this um course in african religion yes and i was really fascinated with african religion and one particular religion i can't remember because it's so many years ago they the high priestess or the priestess of the uh, religion were called mammals. Okay. And so I decided I'm going to create this land um, called Mammal Land. And in it, you know, the black women here, they're high priestess of themselves. So high priest, you know, high priestess of themselves. So anyway, um, I use a lot of symbolism in, in, in my work. Um, you'll see fish, which represents the, um, when Jesus, you know, fed the multitude with yeah. fish. And plus I'm also a Pisces. Uh, you may see flying in my work, okay? And flying means flying over adverse, you know, adversity. Um, the houses are spiritual houses. You see butterflies means transformation. Um, Generally, I like pe I like people um, holding, you know, holding things because I don't think you should come empty, you know, come to the table empty. And a lot of the women in my work are actually, you know, even though I did have positive role models growing up, are based on 
women that I actually knew, knew growing okay. up and women that I learned about historically. Um, like my godmother was one, my Aunt Aretha. Um, I had teachers, you know, Mrs. Foster, Mrs. Miller. Then also people like Tony, you know, Tony Mor Morrison, um, Ella Walker, Fannie Lou Hame Hamer. Um, those are some, those are some, my, um, those are some of the people, Dr. Um, Samella Lewis, um, Dr. Margaret Barrels, are some of the people that, are, that, that I base these mammals on. Mm -hmm. And and I, I will tell you something else about the collages too. When I do the collages, I do not get any new materials, but um, but glue. And the reason okay. is it forces me to think. It's too easy to go say I you know I need this. I got to find this. So it actually you know forces me. And I should tell you when I was a kid, I wanted to be two things. I wanted to be was an anthropologist, okay, or a writer. Okay. And I used to write a lot when I was a kid. I should get back to writing. I used to write a lot of weird stories. <laughs> so also in my collages, I include a chicken. And I'll tell you my chicken story. Why? Okay. I've noticed when, a lot of chickens. Huh? I've noticed that there's a lot of chickens. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you what the chickens are all about. Okay. When... I told you my father was in Baltimore and my mother was from North Carolina mm -hmm. and she lived part of her life on a farm. Okay. And when my father got, when I was a little girl, when my father got paid every payday, he would bring us a treat. Sometimes it'd be donuts. He would stop at the, you know, there was a bakery in our neighborhood. He would bring, you know, bring that. Sometimes it was bologna sandwiches or, liverworks and crackers which i can't stand i can't stand either one now but i used to love them when i was a kid. i used to love them when i was you know a kid and one time he brought lettuce and tomato sandwiches and i was pissed off i, was pissed off. I said daddy why you do that but now i mostly eat vegetarian so i i like that but this particular day he brought home a chicken and i was so excited i had to be about seven eight years old and there were eight in my family, but at the time there was just three of us. So I thought he brought I and my five and my brothers a pet. And I was so oh. excited. I was gonna have a pet chicken. Boy, oh, was I wrong. So what my mother did was took that chicken, wrung that chicken neck. The chicken flew all over, you know, flew all over the place. And I screamed. I was oh, actually my hard. I ran and hid under my mother's bed, and yeah, you know, and guess what we had for dinner that night? Uh, not tomato <laughs> sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> I probably went, well, well, it was that chicken, and I refused oh. to eat it, and it was a long time before I ate any chicken, and that's when I learned one of my first truths in life, that some things have to die in order for other things to live so i used to think that food used to come in nice little neat packages like you see in the food you know that you see in the store i didn't know that they were you know that they were living things and they had to die so this is one of my first truths and it was also one of my first fears fears so in my collages and actually sometimes in my drawings and my pastels i may put a chicken in the, the, the women take care of the chickens because they take care of their own truths and their fears. So that's why chickens are in there. But I use other, you know, like I said, other symbols too. Like um, tea, I use like teacups sometime. Um, the reason is, because when I was, you know, stu you know studying the history, uh, African-American women, you know, back in the day, you know, 50s, 40, you know, beyond that, they would, you know, they would meet and they would have power out, you know, meetings, you know, for civil rights and for the communities, for the church. So the, tea, you know, the tea, you know, the tea, the meetings with the tea were important. Okay. Also, you know, in this particular, you know, particular piece, you see an alligator. And one of the reasons I do make ref historical references in my pieces, and they're, they can be personal history, they can be art history, they can just be, you know, history. I did the alligators because at one time 
that black children were used as bait. Oh my God. To catch, you know, to catch crocodiles. And I said, you know, this was horrible. So it's, it's more or less they wrangling their truth, you know. Uh, if you see watermelons in my piece, because stereotypically they're saying that black people eat wa you know, watermelons. They're yeah. grasping the truth. There's nothing wrong with eating watermelons. Now, a lot of stereotypes are based in truths, like Jewish people. Sometimes they refer to them as money grubbing, which is not true, but that stems from because they used to be bankers and they used to look up people, you know, other people look upon handing money as, as a dirty thing. Right. So, but they, it's, 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 the stereotypes basically is they're twisting the truth. So, can we go to the next one? Sure. When you talk about the only thing that you get new is your glue, what, what mm -hmm. kind of magazines or what kind of imagery do you draw from? Do you have a collection of, of magazines? I have magazines, paper, um, fabrics, found, you know, found objects. There have been some collages, not many, where I may have painted on them or mm -hmm. drawn on them or, you know, but um, it makes part of the, you know, fun. And I buy materials, people give me materials. I find, you know, find materials. And sometimes, you know, I had a niece and, you know, my grand, you know, grand, oldest grandson and even my great grandchildren, they'll go around and say, oh, look, grandma, you can make art with this. That's and fantastic. So, oh. One of yeah. the things that we have as a, first off, as, a, as an educator, we have um, a, probably a million National Geographics from uh -huh. 1954 and earlier that, that we use. And one of the struggles our, my students tend to have is they're not finding the imagery that they're looking for. And so they, they, they want to use their most current, you know, whatever, Sports Illustrated or do a Google search. And one of the things that I really admire about the work that you produce, um, and, and I, you know, I also teach uh, the artist Romare Bearden. I love how these characters and buildings and objects are built from so many different things that are, they're not even part of what they're supposed to be. Uh, you know, like houses can be built from landscapes or things like that so i just i love how you do that with yeah I, I think that's important because really how i look at collages i look at them it's just another medium it's just like painting you're looking at color you're looking at you know texture and i don't think when you do collages you know uh, i'm trying to think this one artist he makes images out of dollar bills mm -hmm. you don't, you, okay I've seen but yeah you know, they're looking at the image. This is just like a material. And I think to do really good collage, you, you know, I don't think you should focus so much on the images. Yeah, right. you can, you know, look at things like, I'm looking for a particular red. I'm looking for something for skin c color, uh, mm -hmm. hair. And hair does not have to be hair, you know. It's, you have to use your imagination to see beyond that. And it's interesting that you, um, you know, talking about National Geographic, there was another artist I knew, he was from Milwaukee, he died some years ago, his name was Patrick Turner. Oh, and yeah. He did, he did a lot of collages out, you know, out of National Geographic, and his work was phenomenal. So if you look at, you know, what I would say to students, look at, you know, look at, you know, masterful collage artists, and look how they're handling the materials. They may not particularly looking for images. They're looking for things to say what they say, and they're looking, you know, for color. It's just like you're painting, just like you're drawing, just like you're doing a piece of sculpture. So let me talk about this particular piece. Yeah. I did this piece the year that Barack Obama ran, you know, you know, ran for president. And this piece is not about Barack Obama. Right. Okay. And it's called A Year of Our Song because that's the first time I ever see an election where they had a diverse group of candidates. They had a woman, African American, uh, Mexican, Amer you know, American. And 
this these this collage is basically um celebrating that we got to a point in American history, you know, where you could see diverse candidates and all the candidates weren't white male. And don't get me wrong, I think white males are cool. Okay. Thank and you. but but you know, it was interesting. So I wanted to do a piece on that. And I tell you like some things that um, people give me, you know, give me like the little squares, the little fabric squares and stuff. That was given to me by my friend and um, she's also an artist and she's my neighbor. She lives right across the hall, Sanji Hunt. And she's always, you know, she's always, that's another person that always give me something. But um, even when I do faces, the faces that you see, yeah. I'm not cutting out faces. I'm making, I'm actually building the faces. I'm making, the, I'm actually making the faces out of several faces. So, or I'm either recutting the face so it doesn't even, you know, look like anything. But, but this is really about the, you know, pres, you know presidential election in 2018, mm -hmm. and the milestone that we made with, you know, the diverse candidates. Great. And this is and the chickens with them celebrating too. I saw so that in the, in the, it's not a tuba, but yeah, I saw that yeah. in the, uh, the instrument. Yeah. It's a I euphonium. Yeah. <laughs> you, okay. Thank you, Peter. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Now this, this piece here, and like I said, I refer to things from um, history. And one of the things, you know, the, chicken. the woman that's with her, it's called Miss Ann. And for those of you who do not know who Miss Ann was, back in the day um, during slavery, and also if you know, if someone you know, worked in the house, that's what they refer that's what they refer to the mistress of the house as, Miss Ann. And also, you know, also they also refer to the master of the house, Mr. Charlie. Okay. Oh. And back in the 60s and 70s, they did. So one of the things, that, like this particular piece, I'm talking about the legacy that we have. You know, one thing I think about, and some people may disagree with me, about when we learn history is that we always learn the, a lot of it is fairy tales, so you actually find the truth. You know, like when I was growing up, I, you know, I learned, one of the things I learned was, you know, George Washington never told a lie. And now I think about it, it's probably, he probably did, well, he well, told lies. Uh, like Paul Revere, uh, he did that ride, and I was re uh, reading some years ago that he didn't do the complete ride. And I can't think of the writer who wrote, you know, who wrote that story, but I was reading mm -hmm. this, this article, and they were saying he did put this other Revere because it it, it 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 sounded better. But huh. I'm just saying we don't when we look at history, we tend to look at a glamorized portion of history. And I actually feel that we should look at all our yeah, you know, all our all our histories. And that's how we learn. And we don't learn if we don't, you know, we, we we're doomed to repeat you know, repeat it. So you see, you know, Miss Ann and the black, you know, the mammal, they're, you know, they're marching together and they're marching again to find their truth. Again, you see you hold the fish. Um, also flowers are another, uh, is a, you know, is another symbol I use. For me, they also means rebirth, you know, because we can have rebirth of the soul. And I feel that in America, we can have rebirth of the soul, and we have had rebirth of the, of the soul several times throughout history, yeah. um, from the time this country was inception. Um, we did, you know, with slavery, uh, we got rid of child labor, um, you know, how we tr treated workers in the labor movement, and even now. And so we're like an ongoing process. So it's like an ongoing story. And we should never stop. So we can go to the next one. If anybody have, can they ask questions? If they absolutely, want? absolutely. If okay. you have any questions as we're going along, just unmute yourself and and chime in. 
Okay. I was going to ask. I noticed that there there was a hand. You you have a lot of hands as well as chickens. I was wondering, like, there's a hand there. In the first one, in the first collage, we saw there was a a hand coming out of one of the windows yeah. of the house as well. Okay. What, what, if you what see, are, what are um, if you see hands or people in the windows, those are ancestors. Oh, wow. And one of the things when I was studying African religion that ancestors were very important. Mm -hmm. And and it's sort of like our ancestors are reaching out, you know, wanting us to learn, mm -hmm. to look, you know, to look at things. And I think too often we get to it in a moment. I remember when I was younger, you know, back in the 60s and early 70s, you know, they used to say, don't trust anybody over 30. Right. And, when I turned 30, I started thinking, well, I guess I can't trust myself anymore. <laughs> but, but, you know, the whole point- Had the same we have, thought. <laughs> that we need to reach back and learn from his, history. And even, you know, now, you know, with this virus is going, you know, going on, I don't think we're learning, we learn from history. I hope we learn from this history, what we, you know, what we should be, you know, should be doing. So any young people out there that's gonna be politicians or scientists, or just playing, you know, citizens, whatever. Remember, you know, look at history and we must learn, you know, you know, learn from it. And again, this is another gathering in in Mammal Land. I guess they don't right. have social distancing. Yes. <laughs> in Mammal Land. But you know, it, it's it's the thing of community. And you know, when I you know, the African American community, and I'm not gonna say yeah, you know, me grow I growing up in Milwaukee, I didn't grow up in segregated neighborhoods. And I think a lot of people forget, you know, back in the fifties and early sixties, you know, you know, there there, you know, there was black, you know, a black section in the neighborhood, but mm -hmm. we lived all over. And when I talk to people that's older than I, you know, I am you know, the neighborhoods were integrated. They began to change in the 60s. Right. So this is really a reflection of community. And I forgot to tell you what the houses mean. If you see houses or you see me doing a room, it's more a spiritual house. Is is mm -hmm. is dealing with your own spirituality because it took a lot for me to heal, you know. Because I'm going to tell you, I was a you know, very angry young woman. And I know people say, oh, you're so chill now. You know, Dell is so chill. And anybody knows me like 30, you know, when I was in my 20s, and said, nah, she, ain't, she wasn't chill. But <laughs> I learned, I learned to be chill, chill. But also, you know, too, I would like to, you know, the students to look at, you know, like how I, you know, made up the faces. I didn't just cut up, I didn't cut up these faces. I made them from other, you know, from other faces. So, um, and I'm gonna also tell you that I'm really influenced by quilts. Okay, and I kind of mm. like my collages to have a quilt texture, and you know I'm really fascinated with quilts. I'm fascinated with a lot of things, but we can go to the next one. Yeah, these are wonderful. One of the things that I, I think about, um, and you you've spoken about, is is utilizing similar imagery throughout your pieces. And I think one of the things that I I struggle not myself with, but with my students is that they. They haven't made near enough artwork to have that common thread run through their pieces, but to start to see some of our advanced students and, and mm -hmm. university level students, you know, having that common thing running through their work, uh, it's just, it's wonderful. And to hear the symbolism behind what you do is, is really inspirational. Yeah, I think you stepped on an important point. I didn't seriously start making art till I was 42. And I think the reason why I didn't, because I had anything to say. Okay. Okay. And I think that's very important. That's how you find your voice. You keep right. working, you know. I didn't have anything to say. And I actually, you know, if I did anything, I would just, you know, if I draw one line, I said, ooh, this, uh, you know, this is ugly. This is not going to work. And it was Evelyn that, yeah, you know, Evelyn Patricia Terry that went and told me one important thing. She said, keep working with it. And I'm getting to realize that I was like, I like art. I mean, like life. You got to keep working with life, no matter what, you know, what comes. So keep working with your art. You'll find your, you know, find your voice. Don't, you know, don't worry about it. 
Okay, this here is a children's book I illustrated with Nancy Morinter. She wrote the book, and the book is called Electric Angel. And it was really an interesting process because unlike when you do a collage and when you, you know, illustrate a whole book, okay, you got to have everything alike. It yeah. got to be, you know, have to be consistent. So I figured it out. I'm going to tell you. Uh -oh. you know, it Here's was a secret. Hard. And it's, it's no longer in print, but it will be back in print because Nancy, they're in the process um, of doing the layout. And it's going to be interest. It's going to be interesting because it's the same. You know, it's the, it's the same artwork, right. but mm -hmm. but it's going to be a whole different layout. Huh. So, which is you know, okay. which is interesting. And th and this book, this particular book, is about a little girl in Chicago, and she's going to a concert. And I can't even think of the name of the park park because I, I i have been to the park but she's going to see a concert with her parent, parents so we can go to the next one that's great is that in i love these i love these so much Della. these are just oh so great well i'm gonna tell you why i start making the dolls <laughs> um when i was when, you know when i was a little girl in the you know 1950s and er, you know early 60s all the dolls that I owned were white except for one. And my Aunt Aretha, which I thought was way older than I thought. When you're a kid, you know, you know, all adults look like they're real big and you think they're older than what they were. I found out later she was a teenager. <laughs> she gave me my first black doll. doll. You know what else I noticed too with adults? When you're a kid, it seemed like when you're a kid, all the adults are real tall. And then when you get grown, well, they only five two or five. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so anyway, um, I started making the dolls. My mother gave me a doll, a pillow doll, when I was a little girl. She was blonde, blue eyes, and she got the doll. Well, back then in the fifties, you could, and in the sixties too, and maybe in you know in the early seventies, if you brought mm -hmm. cereal. You can, you know, you can go ahead and you can get, you know, you can get a prize. I think she right. may have paid like 20, you know, 20, 20 cents or 25 cents for the dolls. And I started making the dolls because I started making the pillow dolls because I wanted to do a black version of the doll. And I wanted, you know, to connect with my childhood, you know, about the dolls. Now, which, you know, which of my dolls is the same price, you know, process. I only use materials that I have. I, you know, they're made out of muslin. Mm -hmm. um, I paint them with acrylics and then I use found objects. And, mm -hmm. and also I write a little story. Now I also make dolls out of clothespins, spoons. Um, I make my own thing, okay? But primary I make them out the, the pillow dolls. And I like the eyes on my dolls because sometimes, you know, like I said, they look like, you know, why, you know, why I'm, in, you know, why I'm in this mess. But, um, <laughs> you know, but they all got, you know, they all got little stories and little, little rhymes. And I think about Dr. Seuss because Dr. Seuss was one of my favorite, you know, was one of my favorite writers. And I tell you what else I like too that also influenced my work: um, cartoons. And I used to love Rocky. Mm -hmm. And Bullwinkle, oh, yeah. Peabody's his, I like Peabody's history and fractured fairy tales. So this is what, when I create. This is what I think. And I'm gonna tell you, as a kid, I had a really twisted imagination. And I thought, you know, I told you I wanted to be a writer, mm -hmm. and I would write stories. Like I used to love when they, you know, in English you had to write a story. Like I wrote once about um, Santa Claus. People always, I wrote. In my story, the Santa Claus had a nervous breakdown. Then I wrote a, I wrote another story, and we it was in English. The assignment, you know, was that these two gamblers were playing, and one shot one, and everybody wrote that he's cheating. I wrote about the guy shot him because he was a sore loser. Oh. So I have, you know, 
<laughs> I always had a warped imagination. And, you know, I keep saying one day I wanted to get back to, you know, try my hand as writing, particularly fiction. The only thing that I have written and, you know, I wrote a couple articles and I wrote some essays on art. And that was something I loved in college, too. I loved to write. So I used to, you know, write stuff. And then people would say, oh, this sounds just like a book. You know, yeah. technical uh, stuff. But I, mm. I really like fiction. Have you got anything started, or just uh, you just need encouragement? I need encouragement. That's no, what I, I think you should start writing a story. You would okay. do a great job. It. Okay. <laughs> and okay. I know somebody to illustrate it for you. Okay. Uh, okay. Della, I have so enjoyed listening to you. You're an amazing storyteller. I could listen to you for hours talk about. Oh, really? <laughs> Not just your art, but the stories of your life are, are wonderful. Uh -huh. I would love to hear more from you. Thank you oh. so much for sharing all of this with us. Yeah, and stories are very important to me. And as I told you, I was a very angry young woman. And it wasn't until I started learning what other people's stories, because I think too often we think we know what's going on with somebody, you know, with mm. somebody else. And I remember when I was working for Milwaukee County and I told you that I was a, a union steward. Yeah. And there was this guy that worked named Bob. And um, Bob, it, it, Bob had schizophrenia, like my mother. And, and people, were, when people were saying that Bob murdered his wife, uh, you know, you know, and because Bob, you know, was, was different. Yeah. Well, Bob was having problems because he stopped taking his medication. So I and the chief steward then, you know, his name was John Crop. We went and got in contact with his family and we learned a lot about Bob. And it actually had me looking at Bob differently. Um, found out that Bob came from a very wealthy family. Hmm. Bob was in college. He wanted to be a doctor then schizophrenia hit yeah. and you know and it was amazing to me that people had made up all these stories about him and none of it was true right and I, you know and it's you know there's been you know other stories with people throughout my life that i you know learned even learning my own mother's story like my mom you know my mother for instance um she wanted to go to college and she used to, you know, tell me, my mother knew like Nat King Cole, because when I was a kid, I used to like go going through old photographs. I'm really fascinated with old photographs. And a lot of things in my, in my work, I may add, you know, when I do the clothing, I may add different decades of clothing. Yeah. But a lot of times I think mm. about the 50s, 40s, 60s, and, you know, time, you know times before that. But my, mo my mother wanted to go, you know, go to college. And um, she knew that King Cole and his wife. And his wife's aunt was named Dr. Sh you know, was Charlotte Hawkins. And Charlotte Hawkins was an educator, you know, you know, back in the 20s, 30s, before, you know, all the way up to the 1970s. And she had this private school. And at, you know, at the school, a lot of you know entertainers, the rich black people sent them there, but it was poor kids going there too. So my mother went there and she had pictures of them. And um, I had a chance to go visit the school. I went to visit my aunt a few yeah you know, a few years ago, and I had the chance to go visit the you know visit the school. And I learned you know it was really I don't know it 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 it, it really overwhelmed me. Cause I thought my mother was there and you know, that she was in her house. And then my aunt told me something that I never knew about my mother. I never knew that my mother either wanted to be a teacher or a scientist. And all, you know, most of my brothers are real good at math and science. I wasn't. And I used to think they got it from my father and my father, he went to two years of walking school of engineering and my, I found out from my aunt that my mother went to the school. Back then in North Carolina, she, my aunt told me the high school only went up to 11th grade. So uh, Charlotte, you know, Charlotte Hawkins Brown, I guess she knew, you know, 
my you know, grandfather and she wanted, you know, she said she would let my mother to come to, you know, come go to school there. And that um, she would see that my mother got, you know, would get into college. Mm -hmm. And what my aunt said would happen was that my mother was very disappointed. She didn't, she didn't get her into college and basically used my mother as a servant. Okay. And, and I, it got me thinking, I said, that's probably one of the things that, you know, my mother had a lot of disappointment. Uh -huh. So, so, you know, a lot of that, you know, a lot of that dry, you know, dries my you know, work. And, but learning that particular story about my mother, because I was very angry with my parents because they weren't, you know, wore a cleaver, you know, and, you know, June, you know, June right. cleaver. I remember when I, you know, when my son was younger, you know, he wanted, he wanted me to be like June cleaver. And I told him, I don't know how many women wear pearls and do, you know, mop floors and a dress in high heels. So, you know, but not too many. You, you know, know, you bring up too. you bring up one of the points of of not knowing everybody's story, and being in a situation like we are, where we're all at home and, and doing this. And one of the biggest struggles I've had as an educator, and I know a lot of other teachers feel the same, is not having every student come every single time. And, and one of the things that takes me some time to figure out is I don't know their story. I don't know what's happening. And and that's been a really important thing for me to come to grips with. So thank you for making that point. Yeah, I think I, yeah, I think it's important because we uh, we assume, yeah, we assume a lot. Yeah. Okay. This this piece is a pastel that I did, and um, it's you know, it's about knowing your own truth, and I like to think of my women also as Eves. <laughs> for one re for one reason, because we seem to blame everything on women, you know, you know, you know, Adam, you know, Adam and Eve were in the, you know, in the garden, and you know, a lot of people blame Eve, yeah. you know, it's all Eve fault, mm -hmm. you know, Adam has no responsibility in it, but yeah. it's, and then you know, you see the snake, the snake there, which represents the ser serpent, you know, the you know, the devil, the demons yeah. that we have in ourselves and it's basically is I, I really feel if people I you know if you come to grips with your truth and learn your truths that's the truth that's one of your first steps in you know being free and so this this you know this young woman here is learning her truth and learning how to be you know how to be free so we can go to the next one okay uh, one of the favorite things I like doing is drawing Okay. Actually, you know, that's, people may find that strange. I, I like drawing more than doing, you know, collages or pastels or, you know, or painting. And this is part of my little color girl series. And the little color girl is always, you know, all scribbled, you know, scribbled up. Um, as you can see, you can't see her eyes, her features or anything. And the reason I did that, because too often, I know as you know, as an African American, but other people too who become mar you know marginalized for a whole host of reasons, we don't see them. Um, it, you know, it's not just skin color. Sometimes we don't see a person because they're overweight, or we don't see them because of certain clothes, or because we think they're too old or too you know, too young. Mm -hmm. But because you can't see her, she uses it, it to me, she's very powerful because that allows her to do you know, things. And she's talking to another young woman and letting her know that you know, it's powerful. And I call the man in the background, the Yaya man. He's always trying to you know, start mess. But um, she's trying to t you know, tell this young woman not to, be, you know, not to be ashamed. But I think that's, you know, that's something that we don't see. We tend to look at people. We don't know each other's st stories. We want to judge these people, like I said, by race. Yeah. Um, maybe because they don't have, you know, the best clothes. You don't know. And again, was, I remember I had a friend and he, he was, you know, he was telling me that he was in need of a car loan. And 
everybody turned him down except he went and asked if this guy that he hated okay he was the one that gave him the car loan and i like to say this to the students too when i when i was like in junior high high school you know if you're going through stuff right now sometimes i remember there was this boy that was in our class and a lot of you know people laughed at him and they called him the dumbest person in class mm. and then there was another young boy who was you know he was very smart he could draw I'm not gonna give you the names, but the dumbest person, so-called dumbest person in class, ended up owning a you know a chain of corner grocery stores, only a bunch of cor- and the boy that was getting he got straight A's and stuff. He ended up being a crack addict. Mm. So I was saying this: you don't know where your story may turn, right. and actually, you don't know the person that you're picking on or looking down. They may be the doctor that you need, the plumber that you need, uh, the next president, or you know, whatever. So you know, we need to be a little more kind to each other. Yeah, this is these are great. I could I could sit and listen to you talk all day long too. These are wonderful. And uh oh, I must have a blank slide in there. I think that's oh. the end of it. Oh okay. Well, holy cow! I I'm gonna. Are there any questions by? Anybody at all? This has been phenomenal. Well, Stella from the oh Peter, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to uh, extend my thanks as well. It's been fascinating talking to you. I really, really enjoyed. I wrote down something you were saying, and I just wanted to make sure that I had this right. But I almost okay. I like want to put this on a T-shirt or something. Um, you were saying before, uh, your art is like life. You have to keep working with it for it to turn out the way you like it. Yeah, that yeah, accurate. Yeah. Okay, right. I like. I wrote that down. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That helped that me and- to create because you give up because you think, oh, it got to be like this. It has to be right, you know, right. And life right. is is what you learn. Well, absolutely yeah. right. And, you- and and yeah, and that that was one of the struggles. And I'm sure Frank had the same situation where you have students mm-hmm. who like they start a drawing and they get disappointed because it doesn't quite look right yet. Uh-huh. And it's a matter of continuing with it. It's, it's the power of the right. Wow. Right. Thank you so it's much. It's like a journey. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> well, Ella, thank you so much for the okay. hour of your time. This has been such an inspiration. And well, uh, thank you. We really appreciate it. For those of you who are here, thanks for coming. And next week, we're going to talk with Frank Juarez, Milwaukee okay. painter. And uh, I'll make sure to include you on the list, Della, and everybody okay, else. Okay, send me the here. link because I want to hear his talk. Yeah, it's okay. going to be good. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, right. thanks Thank you. for coming. Absolutely. Hey, thanks Ted. for the invite, Frank. You're welcome. Great. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.